started on this. All right, cool. Uh, right now. Okay, well, we are here today with Tara from the Rodell Institute. I'm so happy that you joined us. Uh, here in Texas, we got the hemp bill that's been passed in December 2018. Trump signed that. And now, uh, just recently, 1325 passed both House and Senate unanimously. The governor signed it, so hemp will be uh, uh, able to grow in Texas. Texas is a very, very large agricultural state. Uh, we grew over 25 million acres last year, so it has a huge potential to do a lot of uh, great work in hemp. Obviously, not all 25 million acres are going to be hemp. But it is an important crop for rotation, and hemp is one of those things that we use as a filler, not a replacement. So, for example, in the, in the industry for paper products, you're not going to be able to reach the, the six tons in a, a, per acre that, that wood is used for paper making. But uh, you can use the filler from hemp into wood to minimize the amount of trees that you do use. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of what it, what it looks like, and people don't really quite understand that. They think it's just the, the end all, but it's more of a relief on a lot of the resources that we use now. Yeah. So uh, tell me a little bit about um, uh, the Rodell Institute, and, the, and give me some credentials on y'all's hemp farming. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, so the Rodell Institute is a nonprofit research and education farm in northeastern Pennsylvania. Um, the Rodell family and... Um, and kind of the work they've been doing has been around for a long time. They kind of started with their small family farm in the early 40s and kind of took this idea and said, let's take chemicals out of it. Let's grow food um, like it used to be grown without the use of, of any synthetics um, and see what that does. I mean, they noticed, um, you know, in their family and their farmer friends and their families how they were, they were suf suffering medically, um, you know, the farmers seemed to be getting hit the hardest and they were questioning it. And so um, they thought, why don't we try uh, to remove some of these chemicals that we don't know a whole lot about and see, and see how that works for us. And so that's kind of how it all started as this, just this small family farm and, and seeing if they could improve their health um, over time. And so, and then it turned into the Rodale Institute and, and later turned into a, a large publishing company um, with uh, many organic publications. And really, that was when this, you know, what now is considered a fad, um, it really isn't. I mean, this is something they've been talking about for a long time, about this word organic. Um, but they also put a lot more meaning behind it. Uh, what organic means, um, we know that it has lost some meaning over the years, and so we really work hard on putting meaning behind it. And so we talk a lot about regenerative organic farming, um, and so that's farming to not only sustain, we heard a lot about sustainability in conjunction with organic, but we don't want to just sustain the land we have. Um, we know that we need to rebuild it and regenerate it um, to continue to farm uh, for our future generations. So that's the kind of work we do about improving our soil to improve our crops and, and ultimately improve the health of humans and, and the planet's health. Um, so that's the work that we do as a whole. Um, we, as a small group, um, do have a pretty large global reach, and it's, it's really great to see uh, this picking up and the work that we're doing being picked up all around the world. And so, but really our mission here and the work we do, we, we conduct research, a solutions-based research to help farmers, to help farmers farm organically, um, and really, especially in that process of transitioning from conventional methods to organic farming. And so we work really hard on on helping farmers, reaching out to farmers, providing support. Um, and so we actually did launch a uh, organic consultation. Um, we actually um, beat the USDA at it and we, Rodale Institute had the first um, professional actually uh, listed organic consultant in uh, the country. So we were really excited about that. Um, that. That'll be really helpful because people are like, we love what you're doing, but how do we get help? And so now we have that set up. Um, and so that's really exciting. But we do conduct, we have full, full research. So we have trials set up on the farm as well as laboratories and offices and classrooms. And so we do have a whole education component as well where college students are coming on and learning things. We take, we have internship programs. Um, we have a veteran farmer training program. And so we're really uh, educating the next generation and, and we're any generation actually um, on how to farm organically. 
um, and to help them get set up with that. And so that's really exciting that we're able to do that. And then we actually have research and data that supports the work we're doing mm -hmm. and supports that organic can um, produce yields. It can be profitable. So that's really about, uh, about what we do at Rodale. Um, now, kind of switching over to hemp, um, you know, we started hearing about it around the time when they were signing um, the Farm Bill, and it was signed in 2016, um, and that, uh, that's when hemp started coming up. And so many states at that time launched pilot programs for research of industrial hemp. And so in 2016, Pennsylvania launched their industrial hemp research pilot program, and the Rodale Institute decided that we wanted to be a part of it. And so we are one of the 16 organizations that grew hemp for the first time in Pennsylvania over 50 years um, in 2017 was when we first put seed in the ground. And so that was really exciting. Um, you know, we learned pretty quickly that we were the only group that was not university backed. So we do have a really strong, um, you know, college, uh, you know, many strong research colleges and ag colleges in, in Pennsylvania. And so they all hopped on right away. And then, um, we kind of decided to go right there with them. And then also we were the only ones attempting to do it uh, under organic, complete organic production. Um, so we were really excited to be special in that way because that's just what we do. We like to boundaries and do things that seem strange and crazy. Um, so that's what we were doing. And so we just started, we wanted to take this crop. So like I said, we're really looking for solutions for farmers. And so we didn't want, we've heard that this is potentially a miracle crop. We know it has a lot of uses. But we didn't want to, like you said, it's not a replacement. Mm -hmm. It's right. something to help build in. So we wanted to treat it like we would any other crop. We want to say, okay, where does this fit into the rotation? How does it fit into our existing rotation? Um, and so that's really also the same basis I go when I first talk to farmers. It's what is your current infrastructure? Infrastructure? Do you have any? Do you have any experience? Uh, what equipment do you have? All of those things. That's that's kind of how you get started. Um, so that's what we did. We decided we have, we have everything we have. We do grain cropping, we do mixed vegetables, but we know in Pennsylvania, um, like you said, much like Texas, it's many row crops. It's corn, it's soy, it's wheat, uh, many of those things. And so we wanted to fit it into that rotation. And so we kind of have something unique here. We have a long-term study uh, that started in 1981 that is a grain cropping systems of conventional and organic side by side. And so that's our largest and that's the longest running study of comparing organic and conventional grain cropping in North America. And so we kind of had that study set in place and we have over 40 years of data um, that's comparing them. And so we thought, let's take the rotations that we're using there that we've been using for 40 years and let's see where hemp fits in. And so we took other fields and we started this rotation. And so and then we plugged, we plugged hemp, in, hemp into it. First, we had to decide where we were going to plug it in. We wanted to try, obviously, all the options, and we will one day, but um, with limited acreage in that first year, uh, we started with um, a simple rotation where it looks like um, you have corn um, and then oats and then soybean and then corn again, or wheat, sorry, and then corn again. Mm -hmm. Uh, we were like, okay, where can we put hemp in? We Right now, industrial hemp is compared a little bit to corn in terms of what it means. We talked about those NPK ratios. Um, for the most part, people are saying it's a lot like corn. It's a heavy feeder. We know that. It's heavy nitrogen if you're putting out that much biomass. Um, we know that's not a perfect description, and there really isn't a lot of information out there with more detail than that. And so we're working on that. So that was my next question, now that you have two years under your belt. In, in regards to research, two years is not a long time. Yeah. Um, both of us, you know, I went to Texas A&M and my degree was sociology. It has nothing to do with, with agriculture. I wound up getting into that much later in my life. <clears throat> but one of the things I also learned was that data takes a long time, organic data especially, takes a long time to, to obtain. You know, it's 100 days to grow and then you have to process that information and then you got to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. Yeah. So two years isn't a lot of, a lot of time. But what kind of information have you guys received in the past two years just over uh, just from what you've done so far? Yeah, so um, so we decided to go run with that rotation and we decided to replace oats in the rotation with hemp. Um, oats isn't a great sell when you're trying to transition farmers to organic. It, it doesn't do well with weed pressure and things like that. Um, but it's a perfect short season summer crop and as as hemp is. And so 
Um, in year one, we grew hemp side by side to sorghum sedan grass because what we decided we wanted to do, we knew, we knew some benefits of hemp. We know it can produce a lot of biomass and naturally suppress weeds. Um, we also know that it has extensive root biomass, which is really helpful with things like breaking up compaction and potentially allowing that to be a tool to reduce tillage, um, which is a huge struggle in organic farming. Weed pressure is really the, one of the biggest struggles by organic farmers. Um, so to have a crop that can potentially reduce those weeds naturally, but break up compaction to allow us to not have to heavily till like you normally do in organic farming, um, sounded like a great option for us. So we kind of coin it that we're using industrial hemp as a dual uh, weed suppression cover crop and cash crop. Um, so sorghum sedan grass is often used in this way to grow tall, smother weeds, um, but it, it doesn't have a high value. And so that's why we're calling hemp a dual cash crop because we know that it could be of higher value. So it's, you're getting the benefits of using it as a cover crop to build soil and uh, break up compaction and suppress weeds, um, but then you're also getting that profit out of it then at the end. Um, right, so the cash crop really comes into play not so much more in, in what you're making from the, from the harvest itself, but in, the, uh, in what it does to the soil and land that you're not having to do later on down the road. Yeah. Right, so you're saving some time and it's, it's benefiting the soil. Do you, it may be too early right now to tell, but do you see any type of, uh, when you replace that rotation with, uh, with corn or anything of that, of that nature that's coming up, do you see a, a larger yield? And, or even have you even gotten to that point? Yeah, so in year one, um, the first thing we noticed is that it works just as well as sorghum sedan grass to suppress weeds. I have this beautiful, beautiful visual that I like to describe to people is that we first planted the hemp. Um, and so we planted very, as heavy as we could, um, about 45 to 50 pounds per acre with a grain drill at seven and a half inch rows. Um, so we wanted to keep it pretty tight because there's data that shows there's a direct correlation between fiber yield and quality to the density of the planting. Mm -hmm. So we, we planted that way and then um, within three days the seeds were germinated. Um, by the end of the week they were hip height and then um, you know we were harvesting in 80 days and we had plants that were 12 feet tall. Um, and what was really beautiful about that is you kind of went into this forest of hemp and there was nothing growing on the floor. So no weeds at all. Um, we saw the very same thing with the sorghum sudan grass. Um, and what was great, we also had these fallow plots where we grew nothing and you're seeing things like um, red root pigweed and ragweed and lamb's quarter and foxtail, these major problem weeds in agriculture. Um, growing just as tall as, as the sorghum. And, and so it was really, that's showing you directly. I have this gorgeous picture that I wish I could show you right now. I can send you later. Yeah, and I definitely do. From the hemp and the fallow plot side by side, and they're all almost equal height. And it's really showing you how successful these plants were at suppressing the weeds. Um, but what we also we're doing was like a long-term continued effect. We, we we're hoping that if you have a plant like this that's acting as a weed suppression cover crop, it's not just when the plant's in the ground, it's going to be for those following seasons. So in year two, um, we always use cover crops in between. So that's also a really great thing about hemp is that it gets off in enough time to be able to get your cover crops in in the fall. Wow. So, so, you're, so we were able to get in things like hairy vetch in our variety trial to fix some nitrogen, which is something that you, is timing is everything. Um, and so in this case, we put rye cover crop um, in between and to use as a, a roll down mulch to plant our soybeans into in the, in the spring. And so that's what we did. We rolled down with our roller crimper, the rye in the spring and planted soybeans. And so we saw uh, the continued effect of hemp and sorghum plots having a reduction in, in weed pressure. Um, so that, that continued effect. And one thing that was really beautiful is we actually saw a complete elimination of pigweed, ragweed, and lamb's quarter in those fields, in the plots where the hemp and the sorghum was. So they weren't even present in year two. Um, it also could be in part due to that, the gorgeous stand of rye we got following the hemp um, that we rolled down as a mulch. So the kind of combination of the two things uh, really helped in reducing the weed pressure in the soybeans, which I don't know if you know um, a lot, I'm sure it might be everywhere, but we had double our annual precipitation last year. So really to get any yield at all, most farmers, especially organic farmers, 
had complete crop loss of, of their grains last year. Um, but what we saw is a yields that were kind of record breaking yields in our soybeans because we had that reduced weed pressure. Um, and also we think that potentially because of the roots biomass uh, breaking up that compaction, we had great water infiltration. So we didn't really have any standing water um, when those soybeans were in there. Um, and so, you know, the national average last year for soybeans was 52.1 bushels per acre, and we had well above 70 in those plots where the hemp and sorghum are. That's amazing. Yeah. That's so, a lot bigger number than I was expecting. Yeah, we were really excited about that. And then in, um, we did just harvest our third crop. So we had wheat this year. So we did a winter wheat, and we harvested in um, about three weeks ago. And uh, again, we're seeing, we have from last year's average, uh, we're well above that average as well in the incorporating hemp into the rotation. Now, of course, um, when something goes really well in research, you don't believe it. So we are repeating it on different sites and around the farm um, to kind of continue to monitor these results. But really, we, we, saw, we saw some things we were really excited about and we hope it continues. We also want to make sure that it's going to continue to have this effect in different um, you know, patterns and climate and soils. Right. So let me ask you th this, uh, with, with starting out, because in Texas, a lot of them are starting out and that's really a lot of what they're asking about is how do we go from what we currently have to implementing hemp into our rotation? Yeah. Or if we have nothing at all, so we to grow hemp. Now we're talking fiber and seeds only. We're not really talking about CBD as that's a completely different type of grow as we, we discussed earlier. But one of the things I want to know is that when you, you have a plot of land, let's say it's just a couple of acres, we'll say about 10 acres. If you're wanting to grow fiber in 10 acres enough to do anything, or is it something that you know you can still consider it? Because you may not make a lot of, uh, a lot of money off of 10 acres of just fiber, but is it still worth doing if you have other crops on that land? Yeah, I definitely think so. I think you have to uh, like kind of look at the benefits of not only the economic outcome of, of using hemp, but also the economic benefit it's having on your other crops and their yields. Um, so I think that if you, you know, put a price tag to that, um, it really is worth it. I think I always advise to start small because there's just so much we don't know about hemp. Um, you know, we haven't grown it in every soil type in every climate, so we just, we don't know. And, and most of the varieties that are available to us come, you know, for fiber, mostly from Europe and grain from Canada and, and other places. And so we don't know how they grow uh, across the United States. Uh, so if you have barren land, what's the best way to start prepping your soil to, to take hemp? Yeah, I would say, I mean, we know hemp can handle a lot. Um, you know, one thing we know it doesn't like is to have wet feet. So excess moisture is something that I just don't know if we're ever gonna, how we're gonna combat that. Um, but we know that they're growing it to use it as a bioremediating plant in mining sites and, and, and land that really is uh, so beat up and, and they're healing the soil with the hemp. And so that's really exciting to see. Um, for now, I would say there's just not a lot of information out there as to what are the perfect you know, what does it really need? What does hemp really need? What type of soil, um, what nutrients? Um, I would say that for us, we wanted to get the land as smooth as possible because we know hemp is planted really shallow. Mm -hmm. Planted, we actually um, kind of, it was almost on the surface. We went about a quarter inch uh, down to keep it as shallow as possible. Um, so to be able to get a good contact of the soil to the seed, you know, you have to have it pretty smooth. So we did use, um, you know, heavy tillage to smooth out the land and, and uh, disked and, and packed several times to get it as smooth as possible that first time. Um, but really, I mean, we had seeds that were laying on the surface and they still grew into plants that were 12 feet tall. Um, so till or no-till, I've heard people talk about, oh, you can do no-till. I said, well, I haven't seen study on it yet, so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> somebody has. Yeah, I mean, so for us, like I said, we were using hemp it, we actually used hemp in a no-till system, but what that means, it, we still till to, to put the hemp down. There's just some crops that need a really good seed to soil contact or they're just not going to grow. Um, so in this case, we still had to use tillage before the hemp and the wheat. And this is just after many years of trying to do things no-till and, and some of those small seeds, it just, it's really, really tough um, because the, the ground's getting uneven and, and you're having um, you know, it depends if you have residue left on the ground as well, um, that right. contributes. So, but what, but by 
having hemp in, in the rotation, we were able to reduce tillage to establish our cover crop, which is not something we usually do. Usually we use tillage to establish the cover crop. We didn't need to in this rotation. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did not till before the rye. We did not need to till before the soybeans. Um, and we are planting corn in our last year and we will, will not till to plant the corn. So it's, we are, even though we're using tillage to establish um, both our small grain and the hemp, which we're considering a small grain, um, we are reducing tillage in other ways. So that's, so that's exciting. Um, but we know it's almost impossible to have a complete no-till system unless you're doing something like a pasture. Um, there are parts in the rotation. So really rotational no-till, it, it's, it's still a benefit and it's still um, considered in regenerative organic farming and just regenerative or sustainable farming in general. Um, complete no-till is uh, very unlikely. Right, I can understand that. What about germination rate? Well, we talk about how close the seeds need to be planted together. Uh, talk a little bit about that when you're starting to sow, where it should, how close they should be, what kind of germination rate you should expect. Yeah, so one thing I always test the seed before I go to try to plant it. Um, you're getting, if you're shipping seed from all around the world, you never know, especially they're still getting held up in customs sometimes. Um, so you don't know the storage conditions. So I always do a germination test, um, you know, inside before I attempt to go out to the field. So that's where I start to know what to expect, make sure the seed's viable. Um, and then, like I said, we're using our grain drill um, and we're using our sorghum Sudan grass setting um, to plant it. They're similar seed size. Um, and then we are, so our grain drill is at seven and a half inch rows and we're trying to plant between 45 and 50 pounds per acre. Um, and so, you know, as tight as possible to reduce that weed pressure and get that really good heavy canopy and, and biomass cover. So um, you plant that close together for just fiber, is that both fiber and seed? So we're still playing around with the grain. In year one, we had both grain, fiber, and dual varieties that we treated all the same way. Pretty much, if you have a grain variety and you plant it that tight, it's gonna grow like a fiber. Okay. So you do wanna give them more space. However, right now we're working on a study that's working with grains um, that's giving them more space. So we taped up every other hole and did 15 inch rows um, and went down to about 35. And in that case, the, weed, the weeds are, are competing with the hemp. And so we really have to find that happy medium. I think it's gonna take several studies that are trying all these factors for each cultivar. So that's the problem is every variety is different. Right. So figuring out which variety. Okay, so we're, we found a variety we really love for grain. Now let's play with every factory you can possibly imagine. So that's going to take a lot of time. Um, so that was the next question I had when we're talking about seeds. You're talking about, you know, we call them strains or cultivars, whatever you want to call them. People have different names. And does it matter when it goes to fiber and seed? How much does that really matter? Yeah, I would say for fiber, um, I'm not seeing that it matters a whole lot. Like I said, we started with one that is known to be a really great oilseed grain producer, um, and we grew it just like the fiber variety, and it grew like a fiber. Um, and so now we haven't test, been able to test yet for the quality of fiber. Um, you know, that could change a little bit, but, you know, there's uh, some research out there and some conferences I've went to that, you know, people are saying there is a direct correlation with how the density of the planting and the quality of the fiber. So really the variety shouldn't matter for fiber. Um, as long as you're getting good germination, good cover, and, and, and heavy biomass. Um, and then for, and really that's gonna depend on your, your climate, the conditions. So like your, your weather, your precipitation, your temperature, your day length, all those things. So that's still stuff that we're working on. So that's the only thing that may change for variety it may require different day lengths or, or different um, conditions slightly. Um, so really that's gonna be the only difference. Um, but now in terms of grain variety, I would say for a yield, um, I would say the cultivar doesn't matter um, as long as it's a certified seed source. But in terms of quality of the, the grain, you know, we still have a lot of research to do on that in terms of the nutrients. What about pests? Let's talk about that. That's always been kind of something people say that, you know, it reduced hemp will reduce pests. Uh, I know from having a cannabis farm up in Maine that pests are something you're going to have to deal with. It yeah. is a uh, part of nature. There are plants that are better at, at keeping them at bay than others, but you know, while we're always buying ladybugs, we got 
problems with PM and, and, and blood rot that will happen. So you have to be maintained. And obviously, it's a different type of growing. But it does come from the same family of plant. So the question uh, comes up, what about pests? When you're, when you're doing an, uh, the fiber and the, and the seed type of grow crops, what pests should you be looking for? And how do you combat that organically? Yeah, so we haven't had a lot of issues here. I don't know if it's just the setup of our, um, you know, facility here. Our farm fields kind of lay in the center of all of our buildings and everything. So, but I know that one of the biggest ones that farmers are struggling with in Pennsylvania are birds. Um, if you're growing for grain. And so that's how do you stop birds when you're in an outdoor growing setting. So, I mean, there's probably some methods out there. Uh, I can't say that we've looked into them. Um, uh, we haven't needed to. I would say that, you know, for that, that's really going to be about harvesting as, as soon as you can, as soon as your grain's ready, just get it out of there before the yeah. birds come at it. Um, what about uh, livestock, anything like that? Do you have any issues with livestock problems with them getting getting into the plants or anything of that nature? No, no, they're, uh, I mean, occasionally they get loose, but for the most part, they're um, in their fencing and everything. So um, we haven't had too many issues with that. Outstanding. What about, um, let's talk about watering techniques. Um, you were right, we had a lot more water this year than we had in the past. And it was good to hear that uh, it, 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 it took it very well. The plant and the, and, and the area which we're growing seemed to uh, take that extra amount of water that we get every year. And it's, yeah. you know, we get a ton of water up front, and then it kind of filters off. Like right now, there's no rain. It's August, it's, high, it's 105. Yeah. You know, people are like, how are you going to grow? grow things out here, but yeah. it seems to be able to do it. And right about now is when they would be ready to it anyway. So um, can you talk a little bit about watering that those plants? What does it look like? Yeah, so there's really that critical period in the first, I would say three to four weeks where they do need some type of precipitation. Uh, so for us um, in the first year, that wasn't an issue right when we planted because we got planted pretty late. Um, it was the end of June, beginning of July, uh, because seeds were held up in customs in that first year for months. Um, and so we were having a, a great streak of precipitation at that time, so we didn't have to do anything. In year two, we happened to plant right at the time where we then followed with three weeks of no rain. So we, in that case, had to set up some overhead uh, spraying irrigation um, because we hadn't uh, accounted for us not having rain because we had so much of it last year. Right. There was actually a short period of drought last year, <laughs> and so it just Small happened. Period. Yeah, yeah. So um, in that case, we just used an overhead spray irrigation, but it's really just those first couple weeks until it gets up off the ground, and then after that, hemp really does tend to be pretty drought tolerant. Mm -hmm. And so you know that's that's something that's really great for a lot of regions across the U.S. How do you maximize your your, your canopy rate when you're wanting to grow? As they start, you got the germination; they're starting to grow. Uh, you got the water on them. How do you continue to, to maximize that canopy rate as it continues to reach that 12 foot tall? Yeah, I would say for us, as soon as we got them germinated um, and just made sure that there was some moisture in the soil, they thrived. Um, you don't really see a lot of, of, of drop off or, or plants dying um, after that point in, in the industrial varieties. Oh, it's outstanding. That's good to know. <laughs> so do you walk, when you walk your crops, what should, and you're in fiber, they're growing. Uh, now you harvest fiber at a different time and you're going to harvest your seed, right? And, and I, I tell people a lot of it's kind of like a, a person growing up, you know, when they're at the fiber, you start to harvest them. It's really right before they get into puberty where their chemical compound starts to change. Yeah. You know, you don't get the THC and the CBD from an immature plant that's used for fiber. Now, for composites, they tend to like the fiber that comes from both seed and grain. So if you're harvesting for seed for, for dual purposes, that stock is really good for composites um, because it's been on there for a much longer time. It's not a, a youth uh, fiber. It's much stronger now. So when you're walking your plants, I guess it really depends on what you're growing for, what are some of the things you want to kind of keep an eye out on? Yeah, so for us, I know one issue with hemp, especially with increased moisture, is, is mold. And if you're looking at fiber, mold is going to be your, your number one enemy. And so definitely looking out for that um, uh, is something that I walk for. And then for me, I'm paying attention to, you know, flowering. So for fiber, like you said, usually you're harvesting for immature 
um, immature plants, when they first start to set those buds, you can consider harvesting. Um, we did not do that in the first year. Um, because we were growing a mixture of grain, dual, and fiber, we let them go all the way until, um, really until we started the seed launching, which was probably not the best solution, but um, you know, they were in there for such a short amount of time. Like I said, we didn't get planted until the first week of July. And you know, they're supposed to be a 100 day plants. And by the second week of August, we're talking about harvesting. That's, I mean, it's, you know, 60 days. <laughs> right, so, I, so it's a lot sooner. It's a yeah, lot sooner. So they adjusted to that though. They adjusted to that day length and, and, and grew. We still had plants that were 12 feet tall. Wow. So I know usually in plant physiology, if you think about how plants function, like you said, they, they'll switch gears. So when they start to produce flower and, and look into to reproduction, they will switch gears and put all their efforts into that. However, we didn't see a decline, even though we let them go all the way, we didn't see a decline in biomass or height hmm. um, in, in those fiber varieties. They were still growing, uh, you know, 12 feet tall. So, um, but <coughs> realistically, that's not normally how plants work. So usually when I see that, and it's also about uniformity, that's a really a, an issue and, and something that's gonna take a lot of time in breeding. Um, the field isn't always uniform. so you have to look at percent of flowering, so how many plants are actually at a stage. So um, I would say when we're above 60% flowering, I would consider harvesting for hemp. Um, Is that for fiber? Yeah, for fiber. Sorry. Okay, and so you're testing, and that, that's why I wanted to ask, once you start seeing that they're fiber, because you're right, you know, people, kids can be the same age, and some go through puberty at an earlier age than others, and mm -hmm. you know, we see the same thing, because we do a lot of breeding at our farm. And so our, our head grower is always um, noticing that different different DNA or, or cuttings <clears throat> grow always differently and they reach maturity differently. And it's just, you know, it's fascinating. It's fascinating to watch because you don't realize how identical living things are. Yeah. You know, they all go through these very similar stages. And yeah. while their DNA may be exactly coming from the same family, they may not grow at the same rate. Yeah. Which is, is you know, fascinating to watch. So when you make a cut, should you cut the flower to make the testing? Is that what they're looking for? Yeah. So, um, you know, most labs, when you are testing, they'll tell you um, to strip the buds, um, which does include usually a little bit of leaf material as well. Um, and so they just said remove the main stem, strip the buds and the leaves off of that main stem, um, and then um, dry it and, and composite it and, and then send it in. So, yeah, I'm, we're, as soon as I start seeing... Um, at least 50% flowering is usually when I'll start testing for potency because I know I'm going to be harvesting within the next three weeks. Right. Now, when you talk about uh, grain, at what <laughs> point do you, do you test at the exact same time that you would test for fiber or do you test because, you, you know, if it's for grain and I test the same time, test on, time I'm testing for fiber, um, my harvest will be different. Yeah. My harvest for grain may be six weeks down the road versus the yeah. three weeks. Yeah, so we're still learning about that for sure. Um, what we're doing is we are collecting samples and we're looking at the grain yield and kind of looking at if it's still increasing or if it's starting to drop off. Um, so that's definitely something we're still monitoring. And like I said, it's going to matter per variety. So it's really getting to know these varieties well. Um, so for us, we're, we're actually collecting data to figure out when to harvest because we really don't know. Mm -hmm. um, because again, it's that uniformity. So like you'll go into the field and you'll see some plants have 100% matured grain ready to be harvested, and then there's other ones that are still green and fleshy. So it's about finding that, that rate, that ratio of, of how much mature seed. So um, it's about getting to know your varieties and knowing about timing and, and when you're getting, you know, at least 80% um, being in full, full grain. Um, so that's something that we're definitely still learning. Uh, so for us, we just started this collection um, and we're watching as of right now, the, the yield is still increasing each week. So we're going to hold off on harvest. Once we start to see that they're dropping grain, we're going to get them off. Um, okay. As soon as we started seeing mature grain, um, even on a few of the plants, we started testing for potency because we know it's going to be within the next three weeks. So this leads me to another question. We talk about equipment. Now, there's, I've heard there's minor alternatives minor modifications you can make to any equipment. If you're a farmer that has corn and soybean and everything else, more likely you have everything that you need mm -hmm. to in include hemp into your farm. Uh, what kind of adjustments do you be making on your combines and other tractors? Yeah, so um, for us, for our fiber, 
Um, we are using a sickle bar mower and a hay bind to bale it. Um, so it's a pretty simple, if you're, if you're, you know, have that equipment already, you're producing hay or straw, you probably already have the equipment you need to harvest for fiber. Um, of course, you're going to need some type of dry facility to store the fiber. Um, and so that's going to be one of the, the main things for fiber side. For grain, yeah, it's about making modifications to your combine or working with the cultivars to grow them in a way that you're able to harvest them. Um, for the most part, you're going to need a combine that's able to raise its header up um, to kind of avoid as much of the stock as you can. Right. And so that's kind of what we're working with here. But for us, like in the first year, we try to do it. But like I said, we grew it as, you know, at 40 pounds for the acre and it was, it got too woody. Um, so we couldn't do it. It was, it was getting, you know, bound up in the combine. So this year we gave them a little bit more space, grew them a little uh, less dense and um, they stayed rather green and, and not super woody and they didn't grow above four feet tall. So we're confident that we will be able to harvest with our uh, combine this year. Interesting. I like that. So now that we have the, it's been harvested and now let's talk about the reading process it's extremely important when you're talking about sending this off to producers because producers mm -hmm. need to be able to decorticate it in the machine but if it's not read it properly it doesn't decorticate properly mm -hmm. so what kind of advice can you give and i know reading is also the whole thing's brand new so reading is also something that we're still trying to figure out where's that sweet spot have you guys yeah. found that sweet spot yet um i don't know we've only um attempted to you know take harvest the for the fiber um once so it's kind of hard to say but for us we kind of let it lay out in the field and we we did uh go through and tet it and, and air it out a few times we wanted to let it get rained on uh, a few times and let it dry out a few times so it's really about finding that that sweet spot which was really hard with all the rain we've been getting almost every day last year um to to find a period where it's then going to dry out after it's been rained on to allow that reading process. And then you also want to take a look if you're starting to get too much of the black mold, I mean, you're going to see some rotting. It, that's, that's what rotting is. It's allowing the plant to rot to separate the fiber from the herd. And, um, but you want to make sure you're not getting this excess uh, black mold, mold growth. And so it's finding that time. So um, for us, it, it, ours were out in the field reading for three weeks. So what, when you bale it, you can use a normal baler to bale it. Mm -hmm. and big, you know some square balers to big round balers depending on what you, what's necessary for you and what your process is going to need uh baling anything special you need to know about baling what kind of moisture content does it need to have what's the best way to, to store it those kind of options yeah i would say i don't have a lot of information on that and it's going to differ depending on who's processing it so that's going to be my number one piece of advice to all farmers is you should have a contract with a processor before you put seed in the ground because they all have their own requirements and they're all still figuring it out. So they're going to tell you, I want you to grow this seed. I want you to grow it this way. This is how much moisture I want when you harvest it. They all are going to have their own recommendations. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to go, you know, for now, we're trying to stick to the basics of, of what you would do if you're harvesting for straw or for hay. Um, you want to have a lower, you know, between 10 and 20% moisture and um, you want to be able to uh, store it in a dry place. Um, but like I said, every processor is going to have their own requirements, depending on what machines they have and, and, and facilities they have to process the bales. Outstanding. Well, you know what? This has been a lot of great information. This is a lot of information people don't know, and you guys are consistently working, trying to find new things. So one of the things we want to make sure we put up on, on the post uh, for where we post this on different locations is your webinars that you guys have, the um, events you guys put on, the workshops that you guys put on are so vitally important. People can, can go up there and attend these to get as much information. And once they do that, can they also be able to contact you guys if they have questions, uh, maybe throw some ideas out there, the you know, complications that they have down on their soil. Because the soil that we have in Texas is clay and it moves all the time. It's mm -hmm. the basements. Uh, yeah. You know, so our, our soil composition is extremely, uh, kind of odd but there's a lot of it there's a yeah. lot there's a lot of growing land out here in texas and i, and I know these farmers are really excited about about uh, him being a part of the rotation so i would like to if you have any other things you want to plug about the rodeo institute that you guys got coming up yeah so um we're always updating for all of our research on our website at rodaleinstitute.org 
Um, and then we do have from the first two years, the updated preliminary results of our hemp research and our trials. And so you can go on to the Rodell Institute's website and look under research under industrial hemp and we'll continue to update that every year um, with our preliminary results. I'm trying to get the information out there as, as quick as possible as we're all learning this together um, to help people. Um, and then also we have uh, any questions that you might have um, more specific, you can uh, contact info at rodaleinstitute.org. Um, and then also if you have specific questions about your farm and what you have and your land and how you might want to incorporate hemp, you can contact our organic consultant services that you could also find on our website. Outstanding. I appreciate it. Well, Tara, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. I know you guys are busy out there this, that time of year. Yeah. So, thank you so much for doing yeah. this. Uh, we're going to spread out the words to get as many people interested as possible so they have the information. I think that's the key thing is having proper information before they start doing this. Every work, this is a whole new market. It's, it's really yeah. exciting. We don't know. It's, it's surprising how much we don't know. Yeah. That's what's absolutely amazing. And uh, we can go into it on in both cannabinoids and, and, and the different plants species that we have in cannabis, uh, the thousands of uses that it has. We're just scratching the surface. And so yeah. uh, I love what you guys are doing out there. And uh, God bless you from Texas. We'll talk to y'all soon. Thank you.